Future Heirs No Waiting, episode number 317, Mitch Jane, Stories, 2004. Two Chairs No Waiting is brought to you each week by the fine folks over at Weaver's Department Store. Drop by over at Weaver's, I know you're going to love it. So head on over there and check out all the amazing things they got. They've got t-shirts, DVDs, books. They've got anything you might desire from Mayberry. So head over there and check things out to that Weaver's Department Store.com. Two Chairs No Waiting is also brought to you by donations from listeners just like you and executive producers. They're co-executive producers tonight of Two Chairs No Waiting are Kent Agee and Anthony Panza. So thank you, uh, Kent and Anthony. I want to appreciate uh, you donating to the show to keep things going. We appreciate it. I appreciate you also joining me right here in Mayberry this evening. Uh, we are going to have a great time this evening uh, with or whenever you're listening to this. Uh, because we have another series of uh, interviews that we're going to be starting, and I know you're going to love this. This week, though, uh, we're going back to 2004, Mayberry Days. Now, at Mayberry Days 2004, the Dillards were actually there. That's right, the Dillards, the original Dillards, all of them. Uh, you, uh, the, you had uh, the Darling Boys, which was uh, Rodney and Doug, and Dean and Mitch. They were all at Mayberry Days along with Maggie as well. But in this particular episode, we're going to be hearing from Mitch Jane. So I know you're going to enjoy this, uh, but Mitch is going to be telling us some stories. Uh, basically what happened was the Dillards, Rodney and Doug and uh, Dean, were playing that that at Mayberry Days that, that weekend in 2004. And uh, one of Rodney's strings broke. So we'll be hearing from uh, Mitch as he comes on stage to kill time while Rodney's able to put his string back together <laughs> on his guitar. But before we do that, uh, to open that show, we actually are going to be able to hear from uh, Floyd and Barney as Floyd tells a story that is often told at Mayberry events uh, when Barney and Floyd are together because uh, it just always seems to happen. I didn't realize that Floyd had been telling this story quite as long as he seems to have because this was 2004, and to me, that's one of the newer jokes, <laughs> or stories, I should say. So we're going to hear that first. Now, before we get started, this was at the Dillard's concert, uh, the show that they do, so they were playing music. I can't play those songs here on the podcast because they're copyrighted. I can't play the performances. So uh, we're going to be hearing a good bit from uh, Mitch, but we're not going to hear the actual performance of the Darling Boys themselves. I know you're disappointed, but that's why you have to come to some of the events in person because that's the only way you'll get to see them. But uh, tonight, I know you're going to enjoy this, so let's head on over, and we're going to hear from first Floyd and Barney are going to be telling us a story, and then we'll be followed up by... Uh, Mitch, but I'll, I'll break in between. So here we go, Floyd and Barney. Uh, you guys can uh, take things away. Folks, we are so glad to see you all tonight. We had a wonderful concert over at the Andy Griffin Playhouse this afternoon, and you are in for a treat, aren't you, Floyd? Oh, yes, yes, you are, yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Floyd. <laughs> um, you know, Floyd's been trying to break into the comedy racket. Did y'all know that? <laughs> Yeah, well, he tried that, too. Hey, that's funny. Yeah. I, I was wondering if you'd share that story with everybody that you shared with me. Which one is that? You know, about your uncles. My uncle? Yeah, that, that was a uh, sailing man. Oh, that was Clara's uncle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, y'all remember Miss Clara? Y'all remember her? Clara Edwards? You know, she's real proud of her family, so she was one day telling me about this relative she had that was a captain of this sailing ship. That's yeah. what she did. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one day they were out sailing along in the ocean there, and the, the guy up in the crow's nest, he yells down, Captain, there's a pirate ship approaching. So, you know, the captain, he pulls out his telescope and looked out and looked across the ocean and saw it. You see it there? Yeah. So a pirate ship approaching, and, and he yelled out to his men, and he said, Bring me my red shirt. And so they went and got his red shirt and brought it to him, and he put it on, and they attacked those pirates and won a great victory. 
That's great, Floyd. Thank you very much. That was really good. No, no, yeah. huh? That's not all. It's not, huh? That's no, not it? No, that's not that's it. That's all you told me. No, there's more. Yeah. There's more, folks. Yeah, so the next day there's they more. were selling along again. And Sorry I started this. Yeah, they were selling along again. And the guy from the crow's nest yells down and he says, Captain, there are two pirate ships approaching. Ooh. Yeah, so he pulled out his telescope and he looked down across the ocean, saw those two telescopes. I mean, those two ships. <laughs> that was binoculars. <laughs> that was binoculars. <laughs> I think you're going to do well on the circuit. It's right? good. Yeah. <laughs> and he yelled out to his men. He said, bring me my red shirt. Red shirt. Well, they didn't understand him. They went and got his red shirt and brought it to him. And they attacked those power ships and again won a big victory. Yeah. Well, okay. well, that's great, Floyd. Well, no, Thank no, you no that's not it. The, the, the officers came to him and said, Captain, why do you keep asking for your red shirt? We don't understand. I guess I'm they were confused. Yeah. I am too. Well, the Most captain said, are confused. Yeah, they're all confused. Look at that one's real confused yeah. right there. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you and, wake him up, honey? Yeah. And, uh, so they, they asked him, why do you ask for your red shirt? And he said, Well, that's because if uh, if I get injured in battle and start to bleed, my men won't see the blood, and so they'll continue to fight valiantly and win the victory. Oh, that's inspiring. I yeah, like so they yeah. thought, well, that's a wise captain. Yeah. Well, the next day... That's was, good. That's no, really good. No, no, that, that, it's not funny, but it's a good story. No, that's not the end. Huh? No, it's, it's not the end? No. Hey, no. folks, it's not the end. Yeah, there's more. Yeah. Sorry, Fluffy. They were sent along the next day, and the guy up in the pirate up there in the in the crow's nest, yeah. he yells down to the captain, Captain, there are ten pirate ships approaching. You're kidding. Ten of them. Ten. Ten. So the captain took out his telescope. All and, ten of his telescopes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, that's good. Yeah. He, he looked out through there and saw those ten pirate ships, and he wow. said, yeah, there, there are ten of them. And he yelled out to his men, he said, Bring me my brown pants! <laughs>while they repaired the string. So here's, uh, here's Mitch Jane. Well, let's bring Mitch Jane up here. And he's such a storyteller. He's yeah. asking his wife. <laughs> Mitch Jane. String kid. <laughs> I never got to say anything until one of them broke a string. <laughs> then I was so supposed to come up and recite Shakespeare. <laughs> but what the fun I got out of all those broken strings was the only thing I was ever good for. I mean, Buddy can play the bass ten times better than I could, but I bet he can't tell his funniest stories. <laughs> Well, <laughs> give it a try if you want to. I, I used to tell them about the way people around Salem, Missouri, talked, which kind of fit in with the Andy Griffith Show. People, the people worked on there, a lot of them from North Carolina, including the makeup man. And they all kind of talked like we did back home. Like, one of the things that I discovered really early on, I was from the north part of Missouri, and when I was going to school, I fell in love with a girl from down in Shannon County and, uh, and, and went down to see what her folks were like and what that county was like. And I don't know about her, but I fell in love with the language. They never said anything like a man's bow-legged down there. That is, that's what you say in North Missouri. Boy, he's sure bow-legged, isn't he? Down in the Ozarks, they say, that man have to get out of bed and turn over. <laughs> Well, now, that kind of language will grow on you. My wife had an aunt who, uh, she had two aunts, and they were sisters, you know, and one said, I don't care if she is my own sister, that's the ugliest woman I've ever seen. <laughs> they had to put a sack over her head for the baby nurse. <laughs> Now, uh, you know, if you've ever heard language like that and you grew, grew up with straight arrow language with people talking like what they 
saw instead of what they meant, uh, you'd get the biggest kick out of the language that I did. You'd get, you'd get the same kind of thrill when you heard somebody say, that man's so short he'd have to stand on a wash tub to see his knees. <laughs> I cleaned that up for you, Anstead. <laughs> I always try to do that as I go along. <laughs> People entertained each other with very simple things, just simple descriptions about stuff. A neighbor of mine inherited some money, and a neighbor of his said, that won't last till it's gone. <laughs> and sure enough, it didn't. I kept collecting these things and writing them down, and I was always looking forward to hearing people who talk like I did. And Andy Griffith was somebody who talked like people that talked in my part of the country and made us feel so at home. We were like, well, that whole show was like a big family. You all know that. It, it had to be. There was no way that show could have been like show business. It was a family thing for, Randy, for, for Andy and for everybody else that worked on the show. And I remember Denver, you remember Denver Powell, we had a great look-a-lock back here, I about fell through my rectum and strangled when I first saw it. Because <laughs> I knew Denver was dead, didn't I? But he and I were good friends. And, and when we first started that show, Denver told us, boys, he said, I don't know when you're gonna end up playing music. And I bet he told you the same thing. Uh, all you guys, you know, the country boys, when you want to. It was one of those things that he tried to do to, to help somebody get started. He said, watch Andy. Andy's an acting lesson. Now, if you're going to do something else, you don't need to worry about it. But if you want to become an actor, watch Andy, and you'll find out everything not to do. <laughs> Plus everything to do. Like the time he told Don Knotts. Don Knotts had a line that didn't amount to nothing. It was about this long. Andy had just memorized the Constitution of the United States. And Don missed his line. And Andy said, Don, I don't understand. you got this little bay line, four, four words, and you can't remember that. And I'm expected to remember the Constitution. He said, if you're going to be on this show, Don, of course, you know, they'd known each other forever and he was kidding him. He said, you're going to have to remember your lies. He said, when in doubt, always say, well. <laughs> well, we all identified with that. Everybody where we come from says, well, you know, uh, in some kind of way. But Andy could make a language out of it. Did you get your string fixed? Yeah. I was afraid of. I'll cut this short, but not very. <laughs> and he said, well, there's kind of well where you're going to scratch your head when you say, well, you know, like you're trying to make up your mind. And there, there's somebody tells you something solemn, and you need to think about it or want to pretend you're thinking about it. You go, well. <laughs> and then there's the one where you're feeling real sorry about somebody told you their Aunt Sophie fell in the cistern last week. And you go, well. <laughs> And my favorite, and Andy can do that as good as anybody, was the one when you're exasperated or scandalized. You go, wait. <laughs> I've covered for strings. I'm going to the house. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. So that uh, Mitch got up there and told those stories. Now, he was, uh, he was not playing with the Dillards at that time because Mitch had had ear uh, hearing problems so he could not hear well enough to actually play the bass with the boys anymore so he just couldn't do it so they uh they had other guys there playing some of the other instruments there uh, uh buddy was playing uh, the bass in the back back there that's what he was talking about uh that buddy could play bass probably better than me but he can't tell his funniest stories is what he was saying so uh the, so anyway he did that and so then later in the show that uh the Rodney and the boys had been playing uh, for quite a while, and it came time to hear the, to play the song Ebo Walker. Well, there's a very nice story that goes along with Ebo Walker and why it was written, because you may or may not know this, but uh, Mitch and Rodney wrote that song. 
so they wrote it it's uh it's there so they it's about a real person and so let's go now and hear mitch tell the ebo walker story i'll tell you we had a request to do a do, do ebo walker mitch you want to come up and tell that story about Ebo and how he wrote it and then uh have a little surprise for you and for me too and um and before we get into the song i'll share it with you Thank you. Sure. Thank you. It's about Dewey. Tell the whole story. I mean, uh, Ebo Walker. Tell the whole truth about it. Yeah, I want you to tell the whole truth about Ebo. Well, of course, we did change his name to protect us. <laughs> Dooley did so good for us. A lot of people did it. Grandpa Jones did it. Porter Wagner did it. All those people. Ebo Walker. Uh, I know what we're doing. We did so good that Rodney and I went into a mental search, which in this case, you know. <laughs> for another song, not Dooley, that would, you know, be, be, people would love it. We were playing for California audiences who'd never seen anybody like us before. <laughs> and as you can imagine, didn't care if they saw us again unless we did something really worthwhile like Dooley. So Roddy and I sat up late one night. Oh, oh it must have been 9.30 at night. <laughs> and Rodney said, you reckon we ought to tell them about Ebo Walker? Could you write something about Ebo Walker? And I said, Rodney, we don't want to touch him with your 10-foot pole. <laughs> and Ronnie said, why not? You know, all he did, he was just a famous drinker. And I said, well, if you think it'd be all right. So using between Rodney's ideas and my lyrics and different things, we talked about this old man around Salem, Missouri, who was a professional drinker. Uh, he's one of those idealistic drinkers. The kids used to look up to him. <laughs> when they got old enough to go down to the pool hall. They'd look up at him, he's a great big tall man. And they'd look up at him and, and say, I've got this jug of stuff that daddy and I made to trick, take the grasshoppers off the truck windshield. <laughs> would you try some of this? <laughs> the man would drink anything. And so he'd unscrew the cap and it was good bouquet. <laughs> All my speed to a two. <laughs> Let me try it, Sam. <clears throat> He'd say, well, it's, yes, it's, this is impertinent without being explosive. <laughs> <laughs> he was Salem's wine taster and everything else taster. And so Roddy and I, we picked up on this thing because the funny thing about Dooley, being an expert, everybody brought their samples to him and he would drink anything that they brought by and give it a try and give them kind of a rating on it. We didn't list it in the Salem paper at all. Uh, his rating just went among experts. Say, oh boy, old Dooley snorted that down. He spent most of his time, you know, flat on the ground recognizing people by their ankles. <laughs> but what we thought would make a funny song was, well, well he died. Well, most of us do that. Uh, but he did it colorfully. He, in the mid, middle of winter, he died in his privet. And Roddy said, now we've got a song going. <laughs> his, his family was not all the swiftest bunch on the creek. Uh, but his, his wife didn't even know he drank. <laughs> Which is a giveaway. <laughs> and and one, one morning, Dooley went out in his back porch and, and what he did, the reason she didn't know, he squirreled away a different place. He'd have a porch rail or down the wood pile or something. And he, and he took off his big sniff or whatever he was into at the time, liquid ranch or whatever, <laughs> and wobbled on out to the privy. And while he was out there, he died. And his wife, not being the swiftest tool in the drawer, <laughs> about the second or third day he was out there, she got uneasy about it. <laughs> and she sent one of their little pocket Bufords out there to check on Daddy. And the kid came back and told it like it is, which those our kids have a tendency to do. He said, Daddy's out there in the privy just froze up stiffer than a woodpecker's lip. <laughs> 
So, you know, they did the right thing by him. You know, you needed to bury him even winter time. You don't want to want somebody to just lay out like cordwood. So they called a they called a hearse, and the hearse couldn't make it down the road. So they just had this regular sedan out there, and they tried to load him in there. And you know, he'd been set up in there for three or four days, and he's kind of that kind of shape. He know? just rode up in the front seat with everybody else. <laughs> his arm out the window. Everybody thought he was waving. Hey, you people, hi! He died that way, reaching for the catalog. <laughs> then, <laughs> then, they finally got him in and got him planted. Of course, you had to use dynamite and a bulldozer to do it, but when they got him in the cemetery, here's the thing. The first thaw that comes, he killed the grass for like 50 yards around. And when spring came, he, well, can I say that, Rodney, is all right? When, it, when a really good thought come along, he resurrected two Jehovah's Witnesses next plot over. <laughs> His name is Ebo Walker. <laughs> So I hope you guys enjoyed that. That was Mitch Jane. Uh, he could tell stories with anybody. And uh, he, he did them from real life. So that's what made them even more enjoyable and more fun to hear. He enjoyed uh, collecting uh, things that people said. He thought the way the language was used was interesting. And uh, he was a great writer. Uh, and and the ne in the next couple of weeks here, I want to, we're going to, give you a little bit of a teaser what's coming up uh, that same year in 2004 neil brower who uh, did the interviews uh, a couple of weeks ago that we did with uh, eleanor donahue neil had interviewed the darling boys and maggie and so we're going to be able to hear from them as they tell stories about their life how they got started uh, all that stuff so you may want to go back i'll leave i'll put some links in the show notes to it i did an interview several years ago with rodney dillard I think it was at least two episodes, maybe three episodes with Rodney. You might want to go back and listen to that in preparation for the next two or three weeks when we're going to be hearing from all the darlings uh, other than Briscoe. He, was, uh, he had already passed away by then. But we're going to be hearing from all of them. So we get to hear more from Mitch. We're going to hear from Dean and Rodney and Doug and Maggie Peterson. So, folks, it's going to be uh, a great Great set of, uh, of episodes coming here, kind of focusing on all the darlings, and I hope you're going to enjoy these. I know I am. I'm enjoying reliving some of these things that, uh, wow, 2004 was a while back, and uh, it's been, you know, what's that, 10 years already, 10 and a half years nearly since uh, Mayberry Days of 2004. So uh, for me, at this time, I'm listening. And who knows when you're listening? You might be listening, you know, five years from now. So I hope you're going to enjoy it. These are some special memories that you're probably not going to get anywhere else. So thanks for being here on the podcast, and I hope you're going to come back next time. So I'd love to hear from you. You can give me a call at 888-684-8415. Let me know what you thought about this, about Mitch. Give me some memories of the Dillards or Mitch Jane. I'd love to hear from you. I'll play them on the podcast if you'll call me at 888-684-8415. You can email me at floyd at imayberry.com or just drop by over at twochairsnowaiting.com and all that information is there. So, folks, have a great Mayberry week and think about some of the things Mitch said and smile like it won't last until it's gone. <laughs> I like that one. Y'all have a great week and we'll see you next time right here on Two Chairs. <laughs>